I'll start with the definition of pruning. Pruning is the, or at least the definition I like to use, pruning is the intentional wounding of a tree with a specific purpose in mind or a specific objective in mind, um, not just making cuts to make cuts. Uh, the other thing, there's many types of pruning. There's you know thinning pruning, there's restoration pruning after storms, there's cleaning, basically getting dead and diseased branches out of trees. But today we're gonna concentrate on structural pruning. Hi, my name is Tim McDonald. I'm with the Kansas Forest Service. I'm the Community Forestry Coordinator. And today we're going to talk about pruning and more specifically about structural pruning. Structural pruning is on small trees because we're trying to form that tree so that maybe it has a more storm resistance potential down the road, um, a better branch structure. Uh, it doesn't have uh, co-dominant stems and we'll, we'll discuss all those in detail. So this tree is a crab apple and it's gonna be a small ornamental. It, you know, structural pruning, I, I really concentrate on, on shade trees a lot of times because the shade tree will get 60, 80 feet tall. And if you have some of those bad branch angles or co-dominant stems, we'll show you in a little bit, those have the tendency to split out in storms. On a, on a smaller tree, it, it might not be as critical, but we still need to work on that branch structure and, and those definitely get rid of those co-dominant stems because they're just not good branch attachments. Okay, on this particular tree, I'm, I'm, I chose this tree because it is a, actually a pretty good example of, of pruning that's already been done properly. We've got uh, a good, fairly good central leader coming up in there. Um, it's not always, Central leader doesn't have to necessarily be perfectly straight. As long as it's just dominant, it's probably the more important part. And you can see at the very top, it kind of actually sways over to the south side. And that's kind of purposeful because actually our south wind will probably bring it back a little bit more upright. So on this tree, when we talk about structural pruning, again, the main things you want to talk about is getting rid of these co-dominant stems. And when I talk about a co-dominant stem, is that there are two parts of the plant that are competing with each other. They both want to be a stem. So neither one of them wants to be a branch. They will continue to compete and always want to be a stem. So a lot of times what we'll do is either subordinate the one side, in other words, kind of tell it to be a branch, or we'll take it off completely and just get back to a nice central leader branch. So that's one thing we'll do to this tree, even though some of it's been attended to already. The other thing we'll work on what we call the scaffold branches. The scaffold branches are those lateral branches. You want good separation between branches. You want uh, appropriate size of branches. You want appropriate, when I say appropriate size, they need to be about half to less size of the diameter of the trunk. That diameter of the branch needs to be 50% less diameter or even one third or 30% would be better uh, compared to the size of the trunk. The other thing is you want a nice, you know, fairly 45 to 90 degree branch angle so that they have good uh, a, a branch attachment and orientation, basically north, south, east and west, just nice uniform orientation. Uh, you want separation between the branches, uh, again, because you don't want them all just congregated in one spot that puts a lot of stress on the tree so you want some separation you know in a small ornamental tree that separation might be eight to ten inches on a large shade tree you know if it's an 80 foot shade tree you might want two foot of separation between those branches again that's for many years down the road what we're basically trying to do is just and especially in a state like kansas with our our, our ice storms our wind storms and, and that is we're trying to create a tree that will be more resilient to that uh, potential storm damage and I do believe by taking care of this when the tree is young and actually watching it as it grows and, and treating trees as an investment I mean it's not just something you plant and walk away from you've got to put some money into them and the main reason we we actually have to prune trees like this in the landscape is it's what we call open grown trees if they're grown in the woods they may grow nice and straight because of their crowded they're all reaching for sunlight in the landscape, it's what we call open grown. So they have, they, they reach for sunlight in many different directions and they, they just grow more open. So we have to pay attention to them a little bit closer.
Okay, going back to the codominant stem, when you have two stems that are basically competing with each other, they're somewhat the same diameter, and they're always both going to want to be a stem. They're both, they're all going to have that apical dominance. They're going to want to go up straight. They're going to grow about the same width, but they're always going to compete with each other. So one of the first things we want to do in the structural pruning is get rid of these co-dominant stems. And you can do that, and you can see they've actually already made a, a pruning cut. And again, this tree's been worked on a little bit, so that's a good thing. So you can remove this branch all at once and make one pruning cut, or you can do what we call subordinated and come in here and basically choose a lateral branch, prune it, and you've all of a sudden made that to be more branch-like, and it's gonna act more like a branch, and it's not gonna be the co-dominant leader where you have them both going for the sky. And even on this other side, we may subordinate that one a little bit and get it to spread out a little bit. Anytime you have competition with that leader, now this, this is gonna be our leader all the way up, and again, it, it, it does form a central leader even though it's not perfectly straight, you try to get it straight, but that's not as important as just to make sure that it's dominant. And you can see from this one, the last pruning cut to try to keep it to a central leader, it's kind of more south, southerly direction or southwest direction, because we know this good old Kansas winds will kind of push that leader back. And so a lot of times in Kansas, <laughs> what we do is we choose one that's kind of maybe going off that direction and nature will kind of straighten it back up. You can make a one cut and take that take that branch off here at one time. Your only problem is that you're creating a fairly large wound in comparison to the diameter of the tree. So sometimes we'll do what we call that subordination to bring it down and slow this side actually down. And then we might one year make this cut, take about one third off. It's kind of arbitrary to a certain point. Maybe if we're eventually going to take this off, We'll make another cut one third of the way down from there. And then we've got about one third left. And then if you have a chance to go back to this tree three times, mm -hmm. that's what you can do. Mm -hmm. And also by reducing this, you're allowing the tree some sunlight potentially and you'll get more sprouting on this side. Cause you do this to a homeowner and they're gonna say, whoa, you just took most of that branch off and it's got a gap here now. Well, you're gonna end up with some gaps sometimes, but by subordinating, you might, it might not look as bad one time. But if you can only come to this tree in like cities, cities many times only will come around once every three years and prune or that, they're gonna do a cut like that mm -hmm. because they're not gonna get back to this tree every year. Mm -hmm. So they're mm -hmm. gonna do it in a one type shot method. But next year I may come in and cut it here. And then my third cut will be here. But also sometimes on these, it'll decide to be a branch and will kind of finally start to go that direction. So sometimes on these reductions or these subordinations, it changes its mind and loses the apical dominance and then you may not have to cut it off there. Mm -hmm. so now when we start talking about scaffold branches, again what we want is orientation around the tree. In other words going south, north, east, west, all different directions. And we want separation in these branches like this one and this one are maybe a little close. So I'm going to take that one off. He's looking up in here, and again, I try to prevent them kind of growing all together in one spot. So maybe a, another cut might be right here. And then eventually I'll probably take one of these two off. So I'm starting to get separation of my branches in different spots, and they're not all con congregated in one group, kind of like a Bradford pear. Everybody's very familiar with Bradford pears and how they split out because they have terrible branch attachments. I'm also looking for a nice branch attachment that's you know 45 degrees to 90 degree angle. That's a great branch attachment. The other thing we look for is the size of the branch. Is it size appropriate to the trunk? They call it branch ratio, branch stem ratio. Um, this should be 50% or less, and actually more ideal, one-third the size of the trunk. So that's an appropriate size branch for that. Now, when I talk about separating these branches and that, it, on a small ornamental tree like a crab apple, it's, it's a smaller trees, it's not maybe as important, or you can have uh, six inches to a foot difference between them. Now, when you're talking large shade trees, you might want branch separation of a foot to even maybe two feet 
because the trees will get 60 to 80 feet tall so you want good separation in those you try to uh, uh, somewhat minimize your pruning on a young tree you don't want to prune any more than 20 percent at one time you know because you the more leaf space you leave on that tree the faster it's going to grow because it's more photosynthetics process and that so it's going to create more fruit so we try to keep it to a 20 percent minimum or maximum on small trees actually large mature trees i probably prune no more than 10 percent at a time i'm using a small hand shears which is great for pruning young trees because you're not pruning anything roughly over a half inch in diameter it makes a nice clean cut it's what we call a bypass pruner instead of what we call the short or the anvil pruner that smashes the branch these bypass each other and so it makes a nice clean cut. Here you want to leave what we call the branch collar or the branch, uh, yeah, the branch collar. You want to leave that intact because when we try to cut a branch, we try, you can, and that's kind of that swelled area. You want to make the cut outside that swelled area right next to it because all you're cutting is what we call branch tissue. You're not cutting any stem tissue. Years ago when they taught flush cuts, you go back here to the stem and make a flush cut. You're cutting stem tissue and branch tissue. Why wound the tree worse? You wanna just cut branch tissue so the only thing that will decay potentially inside the stem will be that branch tissue. So why create a bigger wound? So you wanna, it'll almost make a perfect circle most of the, most of the times and that will close like a donut. It'll just close and that's that callus tissue or that, that uh, will close that wound and seal it off. And by doing that with leaving the branch collar intact, it's what we call a branch protection zone, BPZ. It's a branch protection zone and that's, it's gonna seal the wound faster. Mm -hmm. and, and more efficiently. And again, the only thing that would potentially decay into there would be the branch tissue. It's kind of like a, a pinpoint that goes down into that stem and none of the stem is affected. Where when we used to do the flush cuts or people still may do them now, you're cutting into the stem tissue, you're making a larger wound and you're, you're wounding two tissues. Why do that? Just wound the branch tissue, the, it'll seal much quicker. And if you cut into that stem tissue, you have a potential of a larger wound. It's gonna take longer to seal it. And you're cutting into another tissue where actually you can get to some decay into that stem tissue. Mm -hmm. I talked about scaffold branches and a lot of times, and maybe more so with cities, again, maybe they don't get back to street trees as often, some of the smaller cities. Um, Sometimes we have the tendency to leave these lower branches on too long. Now, ideally we leave the lower branches on for a period of time because that creates the taper in the tree, that swelling down at the base creates a nice taper, good strong tree. But sometimes we let them go way too long. This, this branch, unless you want a low branch tree, I mean, there are certain places you want low branch trees, but this has been, this has been left on way too long as far as if it was a street tree or a sidewalk tree that actually street trees need 13 feet of clearance where the power lines come over uh, a sidewalk tree most the ordinances are eight foot maybe 10 foot clearance over the sidewalks you've waited too long to take these branches off you're taking way too much diameter uh, of a branch these should have been cut again when they were probably about that big to gain that clearance and that's the thing we have to realize especially in those clearance situations of sidewalks and streets, everything is temporary to 10 to 13 feet. So we need to treat them as such. Um, we still need to work on them in that, but in, in practice, that development, and then eventually get them lined up. But so many times, it's, this is after the fact. The city has waited uh, 15 years to go back and prune some street trees. Then they have to get pretty drastic. Or you try to do this, you try to remove some side branches, um, but this is a branch that should have been cut off a long time ago. Now we're into a shade tree versus a small ornamental we showed you the first time. This is a uh, maple tree. And the main reason I wanted to show you is it's got a, a good central leader and might show that a little bit better than our first tree, but a great central leader. Um, there's been a co-dominant that's already been reduced, but this tree is, is starting to take some decent shape um, I think we have to maybe work on the scaffold branches a little bit to get them, uh, you know, eventually some separation. But uh, yeah, okay. Okay, 
again talking about the center leader we've got a nice center leader in the tree with the nice bagworm at the very top kind of tells you where the center leader is um, you can see this branch to the back side this one right here has been reduced and it was reduced about a year ago because it was starting to compete and co-dominant because you start to see these two stems were getting a little bit closer in size and they were both competing to be the stem. So it had already been reduced once and it probably needs reduction again. Okay, the, the co-dominant would be right here. This one's a little bit bigger and the reason it is bigger is because this one had already been reduced say a year or two ago because it was starting to compete with those two. But this is a great example of one that had already been reduced because it was competing with that one. And again, you might want to reduce it some more, make a cut there so it's no longer competing. If you're eventually going to take this branch off, we may reduce it even a little bit further and then make a decision next year or the year after that to make a cut there. And then you've pretty much gotten rid of that co-dominant stem. So again, if you have the ability to come back to this tree three separate times or three years apart, you might do that reduction. But if you're only going to come back to the tree once, you may take your pruning cut there and do it all at once. And then now we've got that to a central leader. I'm probably not going to do much with the scaffold branches right now. Um, they all look pretty good. They're, they're a little close together, but this is kind of a, a medium size uh, maple it's a it's a shantung cross maple so it's not going to get as big as a silver maple or anything like that but we may we're looking for those nice branch angles 90 90 degrees to 45 degrees that have a good branch uh, uh, angle to them they're uh, size appropriate you know less than 50 percent of the main stem or I, one third less would actually be more ideal um yeah, I don't know that I would do anything with the scaffolds on this one right now. But you can see, even in the past, there was a, a little bit of a competing stem there that they had removed maybe two years ago. And I think the reason there's a little bit of a stub there is because they couldn't quite get the loppers in there and, you know, could have been maybe just a little bit better cut. Now, this tree has been worked on also, but maybe there's a couple corrections we might make up top. The main point I want to show you here is the branch angles. Again, we've got nice scaffold branch, 45 to, to 90 degrees. Um, the branch ratio aspect is, is uh, you know, smaller than the diameter of the tree. You don't want those branches to be the same diameter. You want them to be 50% less. Maples um, have opposite buds, so a lot of times they have two branches coming off on both sides. You might address that down the road. But then when we start getting up here in the tree, you can see those branch angles are much tighter in there. And those are poor branch attachments because they're too tight. You see what we call a branch bark ridge? That little portion that is sticking out, that actually starts to separate a little bit in that tree and the tissues don't connect in that. So that's not a good branch angle. Here we got a good branch angle. Here we don't have such a great branch angle. Now they've started to actually work on this tree and reducing that, maybe eventually removing these two. I will go up there and do that. But just to show you what we're talking about, this is a co-dominant stem out of a pin oak. And this is actually the branch bark ridge. Unfortunately, we're missing all the bark here, but this other side will show you very clearly. But you can actually start to see a crack in there. Now when we flip the side, when we call it Co-dominant stems, number one, both of these stems are the same diameter. They're both competing with each other. They're both going straight up. They're both growing the same diameter at the same time. But then we get what we call included bark. And that actually shows the bark right in there. And you actually see that crack. There is no tissue connection in that branch right here. There's a little bit of a connection out here, but the bark is actually causing that to separate. And that's what creates the branch bark ridge which is what I'm talking about right here. Branch bark ridge. If you see it on the, on the branch portion as it forms, that's not a good branch attachment. Where many times in a U-shaped branch, you'll see the branch, unfortunately this has a little bit of a branch bark ridge going this way. And 
but you'll see the tissues make that turn. Even though there's a crack that's from drying out, but they make that turn. So many times if you have a U-shaped branch, a U-shaped branch, again, depending on species like Zelkova, they're probably good branch attachments. It's when you start to get close together um, is, is more of a problem. But a lot of times when we see that branch bark ridge grow upward from that union, that's a good branch attachment. So as far as U-shaped branches, we don't get as too concerned, as much concerned about as when we start talking about tight angles like that. We're back at another uh, smaller ornamental red buds and, and unfortunately red buds a lot of times to not so much the new varieties but just our standard eastern uh, red bud has a tendency just to get those narrow branch angles things like that and you can actually see it starting to separate of course this specimen has dried a little bit but you can start to see that branch bark ridge and then there's actually a crack that develops or the included bark is in there and it doesn't allow the tissues to connect and so that's not a good branch angle another example a little bit of a branch bark ridge but not as important on a small ornamental there's the branch bark ridge but still you know if you pay attention to it it'll prevent things like ice storms i'm not as worried because it's not going to be a 60 foot tree you know a, a one foot diameter branch falls on the house or something like that this is a small ornamental but still it'll prevent maybe that ice loading and, and that storm event from splitting and i mean trees aren't cheap and they're an investment you know you might as well protect even the even the smaller trees what we're going to show here is we've got again a nice fairly good branch angle especially for a red bud and then we've got this uh, co-dominant stem potentially here um, because you're starting to see a branch bark ridge these are both the same diameter they're both growing upright um, again we could come in and do a reduction cut and then that might actually want to be a branch or I'm kind of the all or nothing guy I probably need to switch to a maybe more appropriate and use a saw and what you can do a lot of times so I'm not potentially cracking this branch or snapping it is coming here Oop. and make a cut there so I've taken the weight of the branch off I'm not going to strip the bark uh, on the stem or anything like that Some of these, yeah, don't get your hand in the way. It's a sharp saw. There. I've left that branch collar intact. Now we've got rid of all that dominance whatsoever, and it's back to being a central leader tree. Perfect. But what do you do to a tree that, that is now you know, maturing and, and, and that, can you still do something? Um, you're better off trying to do something because, you know, it's gonna split out. I can almost guarantee that in, in either ice storm or wind event or anything like that, it, it will split out eventually or it gains enough weight that it just splits out on its own. So to correct that, yes, you can do it to a certain point in, in mature trees, but you might, again, try that subordination where you take one third out and then that might be enough because all you're trying to do is, is to teach that to not be a stem and to be a branch. Because right now, if you leave them, they're both going to be stems and they're continue. They're going to grow the same size. They're going to continue to separate and they will split up. But in a, in a uh, semi-mature tree or a tree that's still maybe of this size is either do that subordination, which may tell that to be a branch and it'll actually start to develop a branch collar because it's a co-dominant stem there is no branch collar to tell you where to cut so you're kind of doing a just a guesswork but supposedly at times and i i, I don't I've, I've always talked about experimenting with this but you can take one third reduction another year take another third reduction and by the time you make that third year cut there develops a branch collar because again you've taught that to be a branch and there will be somewhat of a branch collar development which again tells you where to cut that branch. 
The other thing is, as you can do that subordination, one third, one third, and make that final cut, that's a three year process. And it is gonna leave a gap on that side of the tree, no question about it. Uh, but as you're doing that one third, one third, one third, some of the, you'll get some sprouting of that dominant that you left and it'll eventually fill in. But if you do that to a homeowner's tree, they're gonna freak out. They're just gonna say, you just took out half my tree. You, well, I'm, I'm working on taking half of your tree out in a three year process, but down the road, your tree's gonna be much better off. Um, or, or that simple reduction cut may, may do the job. And if you, you've improved the tree there, even though the attachment is still always gonna be terrible, that eventually you might wanna do that three-step process and get rid of that branch altogether because it's, it's the branch, even, even for that stem you turn into a branch, that attachment is never gonna change other than diameter. The diameter will decrease a little bit, but that inclusion, that included bark, is always going to be there. So it's it's probably best to maybe try to do the three-year reduction and get rid of it altogether. And yeah, if you explain it to the homeowner, you know, they they, they might understand, but they're gonna they're gonna think you're just you know totally losing half of their tree. Because most of the time those co-dominants, they are one half of the tree. And when you start <laughs> that's why if you did the three-step method, they might, you know, not be as upset. If it was my own tree, I would probably get aggressive with it because again, 20 years down the road, it's kind of probably be a defect that fails even just on its own. Okay, earlier in the video, I mentioned uh, uh, X current and D current forms of trees. This is a perfect example of an X current tree. This is actually pond cypress related to the bald cypress. It keeps a nice good center leader mostly on its own. And then we talk about the branch angles or look to be a little bit more upright and that's just the way this tree grows is a little bit more upright branches more upright foliage but it keeps that nice central leader on not that it's not going to split at some point in time up top many years down the road but most of the time it keeps a good central leader trees like that would be again conifers have the tendency to keep a good central leader uh, bald cypress pin oak a lot of uh, some of the oaks keep a fairly good central leader um, it's those that you know, maybe don't spread out quite as far. We'll keep that, that good central leader. And then we have what we call a decurrent tree, which is a tree that does not keep a central leader. Um, and, and it's almost probably virtually impossible to try to keep a central leader in a decurrent tree. Um, this is probably a little of extreme of the <laughs> not maintaining a central leader, but I said a lot of times the trials, we don't do a lot of pruning too. But yeah, this is definitely a a mishmash of things in here. This one's actually fiddling on this one. You know, this one could have been maybe our central leader to start with. And now we got this montage that's going up with it. It's actually what we call a fiddler branch. It's starting to rub against each other. Um, but, and I, again, this, this, this branch here, ignoring this, this branch here is showing that U shape. And that U shape is a little bit better. It shows a little bit of a branch bark ridge. And again, if you see that branch bark ridge actually coming out of the top here, that's actually a good branch attachment. That means that that bark has not included here. And that bark is actually pushed up. And so there's no inclusion in there to keep the separation of the tissues. This one's got good tissues back and forth, even though it does show a little bit of a ridge. And basically, all the things we were talking about in the small trees, we're talking about, or the main thing we were talking about, we're talking about scaffold branches, but we were talking about that co-dominant stem and why it is so important to keep that tree to a central leader, not always, doesn't have to be perfectly straight, but just a one dominant leader, because inevitably what happens when that tree gets to be a large shade tree is that further begins to separate from the included bark that's in there that's separating the tree tissues. And then ultimately what happens is this. In a large shade tree, you have a co-dominant stem that is split out. This tree's worthless now. I mean, it, it, it needs to come out. It, we could have prevented this. But it, the only trouble is we, we showed you what to do, and you just have to continue to do it, though, through the course of the season. Um, when I worked in the garden center, a lot of times we'd, we'd sell them a tree, lay them down in the back of a pickup, always had a pair of pruning shears, and I would cut a co-dominant stem off the top. Of course, the person who just bought the tree was worried that I just they lost some money out of the tree that I, they just paid for but I said no and, and it, it was a teaching moment you know say hey, I just removed a co-dominant stem you need to watch for that for the rest of this tree's life 
because sometimes even a even a tree that may keep a central leader on its own which is what we call an x current tree which would be like a pin oak keeps a pretty good dominant leader all the way through but it can separate that sample i showed you earlier was actually a pin oak higher up in the tree it finally did separate and become co-dominant stems conifers or evergreens will pretty much keep a good dominant leader in them uh, bald cypress keeps a good dominant leader and then we have what we call the current trees which would be like maples um, honey locust uh, the elms there it's going to be tougher to try to keep a central leader in but we try to do the best we can x current trees are much easier to keep a central leader this is a maple this is pretty much what we would refer to as a decurrent tree so it's going to have some of those issues of co-dominant stems it's a opposite bud tree so it's also going to have more maybe a potential problem of co-dominant stems when the two buds come out and and start to compete with each other but this is what we're trying to bring this 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 is a mortal wound. This is this tree is not going to recover from that. You can see that it is trying to seal the wound back over, but how long is that going to take to seal the wound? That wood on the inside is going to decay long before this closes. So this is a mortal wound. It has to be removed. Plus, it's, it's a safety issue. This side is going to blow off. Now, it's going to take an east wind, which is not very often, but it does happen. And it's just going to blow the other section off the other side. This stuff is preventable by pruning, realizing trees are an investment. You need to put a little bit of money into them. They're open grown in our landscapes that kind of grow that willy nilly way uh, instead of in the, in the woods where they'll kind of keep that central leader and grow upright because of competition. But when we do these open grown trees, they need attention. You need to prune them occasionally, start when they're young, keep doing it through life. It's a lifelong commitment, man. 